It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Chris Mathis is a Grand Rapids, Michigan native who has went on to have a successful career and reach international prominence as a world-class motivational speaker, business coach, entrepreneur, and author. His book, From Success to Significance, The Eight Keys to Achieving a, Any Goal or Dream, it's written by Chris Mathis and Shannon L. Harris. Chris has shared his life-changing message with tens of thousands of people in over 100 countries through the power of his book, live appearances, and other resources. Chris has been featured on dozens of television and radio shows across the country. He is also a weekly columnist for the Grand Rapids Times newspaper in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he serves on the board of directors for Arbor Circle, a mental health agency for youth and families. As one of the most in-demand speakers and coaches today, Chris is most notably known for his ability to take his personal experiences and make them heartfelt and engaging in a way that very few speakers <coughs> rarely can. Chris uses profound truths coupled with anecdotal principles to motivate, inspire, and educate audiences on how to create a larger vision for their lives, overcome the obstacles in their path, and then go on to achieving their goals and dreams. Chris's story of growing up in one of the most poverty-stricken neighborhoods in Grand Rapids, Michigan, being homeless, and still finding a way to fight for his dream has become one, of this, one that is changing the lives of people all over the world. Please give a big round of applause for Chris Mathis. Oh, that's not good. All right. Sit that right there. How's everybody doing? Good. Let's liven up a little bit. Come on. How's everybody doing? Give a round of applause for this event. Let's get some energy going in this room. Just a little bit. This is a good thing. This is something to be excited about, right? <laughs> Good. So first and foremost, before I even start, I want to, um, Janie, where's she at? There she go. So Janie, Janie is the reason I'm here. And so I want to be able to say thank you uh, for extending the opportunity to have me come and share this, this story and uh, testimony and my message with the hopes of encouraging and inspiring others to keep going after their dreams and goals. So thank you. So um, where can I start? So my name is Chris Mathis, like you said. Um, I am a motivational speaker, uh, best-selling author, business coach, entrepreneur, I wear a number of different hats. And I have been on a journey over my uh, last probably 15, 20 years that um, people have found a lot of interest in, <laughs> surprisingly. And um, I wear a lot of hats now. I've done, I've done very well in business, but the catch to it is it didn't start this way. This is what, what you see today and the things you might have read about me or if you've Googled me at all or visited my website, the things that you're seeing now is not what it was like 10, 15, 20 years ago. So for me, um, I was able to tell the story in the book From Success to Significance, The Eight Keys to Achieving Any Goal or Dream. And when I wrote the book, the goal was simply to share eight principles that I had learned on my journey from uh, this kid surrounded by drugs, gangs, and violence to being so successful in business. And one thing that I learned on that journey is that it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about the vacations, the house, and the cars. It was, it was about finding something that had a significant value beyond those things. And that's when I began to realize that it was about serving people. It's where it all started. And so I wanted to be able to tell that story on how helping others became the vehicle I used to get me to my goals and dreams. And so again, I say this is what some of the things that I've done now in the last few years, but it didn't start this way. You see, I'm born and raised in Grand Rapids, kid from poverty. My father was a drug addict for 30 years. Left when I was four years old. Single parent mother, um, younger sister. We grew up with my grandparents. My grandparents had six kids. At that time, four or five of them were still living at home, and they all had kids. And then there's us all in one home. So you can only imagine what going to the bathroom was like, or a breakfast in the morning, or any of those things that we commonly take uh, for granted. And by the time I was, I would say, 12 or 13 years, years old is when I began to realize my reality. I really began to realize that I, I'm, I come from nothing. I come from poverty. And this is my life. By the time I was 16 years old, um, it really began to set in. I was running with some of the wrong crowds. And I, I, I believe that oftentimes for us as young black males coming from these environments, we simply are a victim of our circumstances. We have not been exposed to other opportunities and options in life to show us what's truly capable for us. And so because of those, that lack, we grab hold of anything 
that looks like a father. We grab hold of anything that embraces us in return. And me as a young man, that's what I did. Um, when I was uh, 16 years old, a friend of mine was murdered at a party. A year or so later, I attended a party. I saw a guy get shot right in front of me. I ran out the back door. And for me, at that moment in my life, that was my reality check. That was, I, I felt as if God was saying, Chris, if you don't do something different with your life, you could be next. But where do I begin? Where do I start? What you see today is not what I was back then. I, I was a kid from the inner city, surrounded by drugs, gangs, and violence, and did not know which direction to turn in to find something greater. And at that time, I was working at a small deli in Woodland Mall, uh, one of the local malls in Grand Rapids. And across the hall from me was a tuxedo store. And I remember I used to daydream about what it would be like to work at that store. And, and just to be able to come in and dress up real nice and work with people. And then I would look at my own shirt, and I'm covered in mayonnaise and mustard and tomatoes. And, and any time I would have this moment of daydreaming about what that would be like, that little voice that we all have, right, in the back of our heads, that little voice told me, Chris, you don't have any experience. You've never done anything like that before. Why would they ever give you an opportunity? Take a look across the hall, Chris. No one there working there looks like you. Why do you think you would be the first? And in that moment, I would talk myself out of it. <clears throat> and then one day, I remember seeing a gentleman come walking into the guy's black gentleman. He's dressed real nice, white shirt, tie, black pants, shoes. And when he walked into the store, he didn't stop at the counter. He went straight to the back of the store, and he came out and began helping customers. I had never saw this guy before. And so I went over there, I remember, and I, I just introduced myself. And I told him, you know, I just don't know much about this, but I'm just curious as to how did you get a job here? And he, he kind of told me a little bit about his story and that he was from Flint. And what I learned about his story was very intriguing because one thing that I learned was that he had a very similar background as mine. See, he also had a parent who was on drugs. He also come, was a kid from poverty. But the difference was he had learned how to reach a level of success that I hadn't figured out how to reach yet. And I remember one day having a conversation with him. He says, you know, you should come in and talk with the manager. I think you'd be great here. I said, really? He said, yeah, come on back and see him. And so I remember I came back a few days later. I met with the manager. I had some conversation with him. And he asked me, you know, what kind of experience do you have? And I said, I don't have any. He said, have you ever done anything like this before? I said, no. He said, what have you done? I said, worked across the hall at that deli. And he said, well, here's an application. Fill that out, and, and maybe I'll give you a call. And again, I had no resume. There was no work experience. There was none of those things. So I, I cranked out the application, turned it in, and I, I called him every chance that I got until he was able to say, OK, Chris, let's talk. And one day, I stopped in the store. It was about three, three or so weeks had passed at this time. I stopped in the store, and uh, the typical response that I would usually get is, I haven't seen your application yet. And so before he could give me that answer, after I asked, have you checked it out, two customers walked in the door. So I stepped to the back of the room, and he went. He's working with the customers. And, and there I am, standing in the back of the room, waiting patiently to ask my normal question of, have you seen my application yet, for him to give me his normal answer. And so I remember he wrapped up, I'm sorry, he was working with the customers, then the phone rang. So he goes and he answers the phone. And while he's doing that, I'm standing there thinking, this is my shot. <laughs> this is my shot to show him that I can do this. And I went over to the customer, and I was be honest, be, I'll be honest, I, I don't know much about any of this stuff, but I think if you went with this jacket and you, you put it with, with maybe that shirt and no shoes, I think it would be perfect for your event. And he knew I didn't know what I was talking about. They knew I didn't know, I didn't know what I was talking about. But they were excited because I was excited. And I remember he wrapped up his phone call and he came back over to me and he says, Chris, you know, you've been bugging me for about three weeks or so now. And I'm very impressed with what I just saw you do. Because of that, I want to give you an opportunity. And he hired me. He hired me right on the spot. And you see, at that time, what he did not know was that, well, in his world, in his eyes, he was giving me a job. What he didn't know is he literally changed my life. He literally changed my life with an opportunity. Because before that, I had never received an opportunity before that. And from there, I went on to have success there. And I, I went on to have success in other spaces of business. And then I went and decided to start my first marketing business. I felt I had learned enough by the age of 19 that I was ready to do this and just jump out here into this entrepreneurship world and make this thing move, right? 
And so I, I moved out to Westland, 20 minutes or so, right outside of Detroit here. And I lived out there for two years. My first year there, I was homeless. I had this crazy idea that I'm going to start this business with a few partners of mine, and we have no idea what we're doing, but we're going to figure this thing out. If you've seen the Pursuit of Happiness movie, I've been there where I've shown up at my hotel and my luggage is sitting outside my room because I couldn't pay for the night before. We ate at gas stations on a regular basis because we didn't have enough money to go to a restaurant or to buy groceries. And for me, some would ask, why would you put yourself through that? Because the reason a person would go through that is because they say to themselves, what's worse than what I'm coming from? And for me, there was nothing worse than going back to what I was fighting so hard to get away from. Two years or so go by, we started to have some success, things are getting better. I made a few bad business decisions, and I lost everything. I lost the townhouse, I lost the car, I lost it all, I lost the business. And I ended up moving back into Grand Rapids into my mother's basement for the next four years. And for the next four years, I was broken, I was depressed, I was frustrated, and I had just given up on life. I didn't think that I had it in me to go through this journey all over again for the pursuit of something greater. And at that point in my life, I was willing to accept my current situations. And I remember the only thing I owned was a couch and a TV. And I slept in my mother's basement one particular night, and I remember God speaking to me, and he said, Chris, this is not what I designed you for. And I woke up out of my sleep, and I thought to myself, he's right. I, I've got to give it another shot. I've got to try one more time and just see what happens. And that was the day. That was the day that I made the commitment to myself that no matter what happens, no matter how hard it gets, no matter what happens around me or to me, I'm going to make it. And if I don't make it, I go to my grave knowing I gave it everything I had, and it just wasn't in the cards. That's when I decided it was time to try this business thing over again. I went from there to work for a very large home improvement company doing marketing. Um, by the time I was 25, I was doing very well. I was managing 25 locations around the country, making tons of money and enjoying this single life with no kids and no family and five to six vacations a year, right? That all goes away when you have kids and family. So <laughs> I'm, I'm doing all these amazing things. And I remember I'm coming back from one vacation, and I, and I get back to my place, and it was weird because I just had this epiphany that dawned on me that you've never helped anyone. I've never donated. I've never volunteered. I've never done anything. And so I decided it was time to change that. Because so many people had helped me on my journey, and I've reached this level of success. I want to figure out how do I help others learn what I once didn't know. So they don't have to go through the same process. And that's when I began volunteering and just sharing my story. Fast forward from there, that was September of 2007. It then became professionally done as far as speaking goes. And it's been 12 years this year that I've been doing this. And I've stepped on stages all over the place, all across the country. My book has traveled all over the world. My messages has traveled over 100 countries. I reached a level of success that I never thought was possible for me. And what I learned in that part of my journey was the easiest thing that I've ever done in my entire life is speak. See, I find it so easy. Some people have a fear of this thing up here, right? And I find it so easy to get up here and share these stories with audiences all over. The hardest thing that I've ever done in my entire career is believe. Simply believe that this kid from the hood, who people told wouldn't make it, will one day be known around the world as a motivator, will, will write a book, go on to start businesses, and then go on to serve thousands upon thousands of others with this message to help to encourage them to go on and write a book, or start a business, or whatever that thing is that they're after. But the question that I get asked more often than not is, how did I do it? How did you go from being that kid to being so successful in business? So what I want to give you really quick now is a few key ingredients, a few principles or keys that we call them, that I've personally used to have the success that I've had, not just in business, but also in life. The first ingredient that I want to give you is called the reality check. You see, I've learned there's three types of people in the world. The first are the winners. The winners are the people who have made it. The Oprah Winfrey's, Bill Gates, et cetera, right? They've made it over the top. If, if, if Oprah lost it all tomorrow, 
She can have it all back a day or two later because she's a winner. She knows how to do it. She knows what that process looks like. Then you have the second group, and this is the largest of the three. The second group are the losers. You see, this is the group who have given up on life. These are the groups who give up on their dreams. This group is are the group of people who say, I can't be the first to graduate college in my family. I can't be the first to start a business. That will never happen for me. And they've accepted this belief that, that they are, their current situation is what their future holds. And they have the third group. And this is where I think a lot of you probably come in. The third group are the contenders. What I mean by that is the contender is oftentimes the winner who has not yet learned how to win. But the contender knows if I got a shot, if I got an opportunity, if I just got a chance, I can make some things happen. I'm a diehard boxing fan. I don't know if any of you guys are boxing fans or not, but for me, I, I think about it like a boxing match. Sometimes when the contender goes into the fight with the champ, the contender is the only person that believes that he has the ability to beat the champ. Sometimes his own coach and trainer don't believe. His own quarter doesn't think he has a shot of winning this fight. But he goes in with the mindset that if I can land one good punch on the champ, I can end this whole thing. And that's his goal. And for a lot of people, that's what they're at. They know if I just got a shot, if I just got an opportunity, if someone would just say, we believe in you, here's a chance, you'd take that opportunity and run full speed with it to make something happen. So I believe that as we go after our dreams and our goals, we have to make the decision, are we winners, are we losers, or are we contenders? And you have to be very honest with yourself. And you can change at any given time based on your situation or how you decide to grow your business. The second ingredient that I want to give you, very simple phrase, and one that I, I personally believe is one of the most powerful phrases uh, there are. And I give credit to uh, Les Brown for this one one of my personal mentors. What I've learned is there's a small phrase that you can always hold to be true no matter what happens. And that phrase is, it's possible. It's possible. No matter what happens, it's possible. No matter how hard things become, it's still possible. You see, the belief on the planet in 1954 was that no human being was physically capable of running a mile in under four minutes. Then came along this crazy guy named Roger Bannister. Roger not only ran the mile and won first place, but he ran the mile in under four minutes. After Roger did it, a few others did it. His second place opponent, John Lundy, did it three weeks later. Since then until now, over 20,000 people have run the mile in under four minutes, including high school kids. What changed? The only thing that changed was they saw it's possible. If Roger can do it, I can do it. So that was the belief that I took upon myself when I saw my friend working at that tuxedo store. I took on the belief that if he can do it, I can do it. So it's important that on this journey, you find that example. You find that individual, that business, that organization, whatever that thing is for you. And you hold that as your it's possible moment. And any time you feel that doubt or frustration, you look at that thing and you remind yourself, it's possible. If they can do it, I can do it. The next ingredient that I want to give you is one that I'm sure all of us are familiar with. If, you, if you're in business, if you're an entrepreneur, if, you, if you've lived any amount of time in life, you're familiar with this one. It's hard. Let's just be honest for a second here. There's nothing easy about life. There's nothing easy about starting a business. There's nothing easy about getting it up and running. There's nothing easy about finding a life-work balance. There's nothing easy about how it's going to fit into your marriage, fit into the time with your kids when you have to travel every day, and you're trying to figure this thing out, and you're up late nights bumping your head against the wall wondering why this thing isn't working. It's hard when your friends and family don't believe in you. It's hard when the people around you tell you this thing won't work. And what I've learned during those times is those are the times 
that you must begin to tap into something much deeper. You see, it's, it's, it kind of reminds me of like the, the deer on the highway. We've all seen a dead deer on the side of the highway if you live in Michigan. All right? and, and so this, this deer walks out onto the highway. He sees the oncoming vehicle, but he doesn't get out of the way. <laughs> he stands there, and the vehicle takes him out. Or like the bird who sees the snake and is mesmerized by the winding movements of the snake. If the bird would look away for that long, he would break the spell and get away and live. And for many of us, we do the same in life when it gets hard. We look at our goals. We think about our goals. We dream about our goals. We're all excited about our goals until something happens. Now all of a sudden, we look at the problem. And we talk about it. We think about it. We tell our friends and family about it. Some of you put it all over Facebook and Instagram, and now you've told the world about it. And before you know it, you're under a hypnosis the same way like the deer and the bird. And your problems get closer and closer. And then they consume you whole. And for many of us, we're consumed whole by life. When all we have to do is look away for a second and break the spell. Bring it back to the goal. You, you, you focus on the goal, and you look at the goal, and you think about the goal, and as the problems come, you address it as needed, and then you come back to the goal. But you never, ever focus on the problem. And this is how you will survive the hard times in life and in your business. The next ingredient that I want to give you, in my personal opinion, is, is probably the uh, most important ingredient in my situation. And what I mean by that is by no means am I here to preach religion or am I a pastor of any kind. But I personally believe that you must have faith in a power that's much greater than yourself. You see, there's going to come a time on this journey where you're going to get knocked down and there is nothing that we can say as your friends, your family, your coworkers, your, your partners, the people in your circle, whatever you want to call it. There is nothing that we can say that's going to pull you or lift you out of that hole that you've fallen into. And when that day comes, all you will have left is your faith. You see, for me, I um, was getting ready for a meeting a few years ago. It was, I'll never forget, it was February 10th, 2015. And I was going to meet with a sponsor for a speaking tour that I was preparing to go on, for a 20-city speaking tour. And I remember I got up that morning, and I asked my wife if she could stay home with our newborn, our fairly newborn, since so she's about four or five months old at the time, my daughter Layla. And my wife says, no, I've got to get to work for a little bit. Um, I said, no problem. I'll drop her off at the sitter, and then I'll just pick her up after the meeting is over. Five minutes later, my wife comes back, and she says, you know what? Don't worry about it. I just called in. I'm going to be a little bit late going again, but I'll stay here until you come back. And I said, no problem. And I remember I left out for that meeting that morning like I would any other day. And I'm, I'm just cruising, cruising down the street. Jay-Z's bumping in the background. And I'm just in this real good space, going over my notes in my head, and things are good. And then all of a sudden, I see a flash of burgundy out of the right side of my, my vision. And all I remember was this huge hit. And the car flew left. I hit the middle median, and this was wintertime. Hit this middle median, and, and I just missed a car that was coming behind me. And a, as this is happening, I see this huge mountain of snow in front of me. And I'm thinking, my God, they, that's, that is death's door. Because there is traffic coming the other way on the other side of that. And I remember I came crashing through that, and I landed on the other side of the street, just missing the tail end of another car. And I'm facing the wrong way in traffic. And I remember being in so much pain. And I opened my eyes, and traffic is coming directly at me full speed. And I closed my eyes in that moment. And I said, God, please don't take me now because my family needs me. I took a deep breath. I felt life begin to drain out of me. And I opened my eyes again, and traffic began to slow down right at the front bumper of my car. I could barely see as the smoke was burning from the, from the hood of the car. And a, a guy jumps out of his truck. He runs over. He, he helps me get the door open, and he says, are you okay? And I said, I think so. 
And I stood up out of the car, and I took one step, and I collapsed in the street. He helped drag me to the sidewalk where the ambulance came and got me. And I remember they put me on a stretcher, and they got me in the car, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the ambulance truck. And I said, please, please don't let me die. And he says, Chris, I think you're going to be OK. Do you have any kids? I said, yeah, I have a daughter. But thankfully, my wife stayed home today. Over the next two years, I had to cancel that speaking tour. And I went through a recovery process of therapy for the next two years recovering from my injuries. And I found myself on another couch in front of another TV trying to figure out how I'm going to make this thing work. How am I going to get back up and go again? How am I going to get back out there and stand in front of an audience to speak? I didn't know how I was going to do it. But thankfully, by the grace of God, I'm able to do it again today. So what I learned on this part of my journey was that I found myself in a position where neither man nor money could help me. See, T.D. Jakes once said, if you have a problem that man or money can fix, you don't have a problem. And that's where I found myself in a position where neither man nor money could help me. And all I had left was my faith. So it's crucial to your success that you find whatever that is for you. And that becomes your source of energy and a resource to you on this journey when you find yourself in one of those situations. And see, now that we, we, we get through these hard times, we've, we know what's possible for our journeys. We've done all these things right. Our business is starting to go. And now we've reached the next ingredient. This is what we do this for. And that's the victory. It's the victory. That's what this is all about. And so for me, I remember when I wrote my first book, From Success to Significance, The Eight Keys to Achieving Any Goal or Dream. And I, I had this crazy idea that one day I'm going to go back to that same mall that I worked in at 17 years old as a kid. And I'm going to release my first book there. Because I want to be able to say that I literally went around the world with this story and back to where it all began to tell the story. And I remember I talked to my co-author, Shannon. I was like, Shannon, you know, here's my vision for this thing. And we're going to write this book. We spent the next 11 months telling the story and writing it and getting it all right. And we were prepared to self-publish. And I said, Shannon, before we do that, let me just send this to a few publishers and see what they think. And I did. And surprisingly, all of them accepted and the publisher that I ended up going with, they received 7,000 submissions a year. They only take a, f a handful of those, and I ended up being one of them that year. Thank you. <laughs> and from there, I went on, released the book, and I remember hearing a story from a lady named Lisa Nichols on how she's on her way to an event, and how she said they got caught in a traffic jam. And she was telling her best friend who was with her, her, I'm sorry, her best friend was telling her, Lisa, I wonder if all these people are going to your event. And Lisa's like, there's no way. And then the lady next to her driving realizes that it's Lisa. And she says, Lisa, I'm going to your event. And then she realized that this traffic jam was her event. So as I'm driving to this book signing, I got caught in a traffic jam. And I started to wonder. I wonder if this is my traffic jam. <laughs> and then that little voice that we all have in the back of our mind, Reminded me, Chris, you're a kid from the inner city. You're a first-time author no one's ever heard of. You've never done anything that would, that would demand that kind of traffic for people to come and see you. And I instantly talked myself out of it in that moment. And I remember I got to Barnes & Noble that day, and I, I, I went, I shared my story. And as I'm sharing, I'm seeing the, the thing fill up, and there's people further back than I could see, and wrapped around escalators and everything. And I remember getting downstairs, and I'm signing book. I'm signing a book after book after book. And then uh, my guy, Nick, who designed my book cover, came over. And he says, Chris, this is an amazing event. I says, yeah, this is really cool. But Nick, I've been signing for a little while. Who are all these people and where are they coming from? And he says, Chris, what are you talking about? They're here to see you. And this was the picture he showed me. You see, people waited in line 40, 45 minutes to meet me for all of 30 seconds to simply say thank you. Because they have been following me for so many years. And it was one of the most humbling experiences I've ever had. 
So I say to you, what is your victory? What is that thing for you? Whatever that is, hold on tight and go after it with everything you've got. And the last ingredient that I want to give you. Oh, I'm sorry, it happened again. <laughs> Every time I share, the goal is simply to help people. So the last ingredient is significance. How significant are you becoming as you go on your journey? Who are you sharing your stories with? Who are you encouraging on your path? Who are you taking your tips, your thoughts, your resources back to and saying, here is what I learned and here is how you get there? It's crucial to our success as business owners that we begin this phase. And for me, this is what it's all about. It's simply about sharing with audiences and groups of people who simply say, Chris, I want to figure it out. And it's my job, it's my obligation to tell you what I've learned on my journey with the hopes that it inspires, it encourages, and motivates you to go after your dreams with everything you've got. And the last thing I'm going to give you, it's a poem you'll find at the back of the book. It's called To Live Your Dreams. I want you to listen closely to the words of the poem because I'm going to tell you exactly what it's going to take for you to get to where, from where you are to where you want to be. To live your dreams, you must be willing to fight for it. Take steps every day and night for it. Be willing to give up time and sleep at night for it. Have patience, work hard, and do more than just try for it. Remember, Martin had a dream, and he was willing to die for it. You have to believe and have dreams at night about it. Feel your life is just useless and incomplete without it. Be willing to take a setback to reach it. And know that others before you have achieved it. Know in your heart that you cannot be defeated. Use all your strength, skills, and prepare to take action. And not reaching your goal is never an option. Stay moving forward towards your goal until you hit it. And I promise through the power of God, you'll get it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's give him another round of applause. That was excellent. <laughs> so there are a couple of things I've been asked to mention. Um, first is uh, there are uh, copies of his book available for everyone who provides us with a survey for today. Um, the books are located over there. So. <laughs> so please take some time to, no, okay, wait, wait, wait. 50, because they're signed. Yes, okay, all right. Um, so, okay. All right, get over there and get a book, okay? <laughs> all right, that's